is sending out a dummy, uh, a demo tape that I recorded on pure spec. No one said do it. No one said, hey, kid, make a demo tape. 1993, I go to a little place called Command Productions in Sausalito, California, in an old uh, shipyard, the old Kaiser shipyards, and it was a sound studio. And I made a demo tape in that studio and sent it out to 400 or so radio station program directors with a list that I purchased from a man that I had met on one of my book tours who gave me the list. And as I say, that little vortex has so much going on for me, it's astounding. There's a boat yard where I bought my first big boat. There's uh, a number of things. I don't remember all of the things, but there's a vortex in that area that's astonishing in that little area. So as I say, I, I was coming out early, 8 o'clock after. I go early. It starts at 5, and I have enough after an hour or two. It gets too loud for me and this and that. But I got so drawn into the music. The flautist was as good as Jose Fajardo, one of the greats. The timbales play, I, I, I said to him in Spanish during the break, I said, Tu es el rey de timbal, because he was. He was the king of timbales. It was unbelievable how good these guys were. You have to love the music to understand what I'm saying to you. When music is right, dance music, and not a beat is missed, and it's so compelling, then you, you're transcended. You're lifted off your feet. Even if you're not dancing, you're lifted out of your body. So you have that for that moment without drugs. And so I go out. It's dusk. The stars are up in the sky. It was like one of those where everything is right again. And I wrote a poem called Everyone's a Star Behind Their Car, which I will read to you when I come back on The Savage Nation. <laughs> okay. I asked for it. I got it. I don't know if anyone in my audience likes this music. That's the problem. Play it up, though, anyway. What do I do? It's not the best of it, but I love this music. I not like what music in my funeral. Because of, uh, keep going. This is a little slow for me. I like a much faster pace. This is quick. Try dancing for this sometime, and you'll see if your itis can let you. Whatever itis you may have, see if it'll work on a dance floor, a crowded dance floor with black and Latino men and women. <laughs> Everyone's a star behind their car. Everyone's a star behind the bar. Everyone's a star from afar. For everyone slightly marred. The brigadier, the buccaneer, debonair or doctrinaire. The gondolier or the pamphleteer. Everyone's a star from afar. My friends, that's the poem, Everyone's a Star Behind Their Car. Because in a way, it ties into the Sandman theme of today's show. Everyone is cool from a distance. I mean, not everyone. I, I don't mean the women in Marin County and Volvos, uh, Sobs who cut you off from the right lane with Bernie stickers. But aside from them, people get into a pompous state in their cars. We all do. We prop ourselves up. We put the seat on the highest position if we're short, the lowest position if we're tall. I mean, no one could see your body in a car. So all you see is like a head. And the car, the car becomes an extension of your body. That's why everyone buys a new car if they can afford it. And the car says something. That's what the ads are telling you. The ads are giving you an identity with the car. So if you buy like an Outback, whatever that is, I don't even know what it is, you're going on a trip to the mountains, to the Alpine Mountains with your girlfriend to, to climb in the Alpine. Because you, no one uses it for that. You go to a schlocky job somewhere and work in a cubicle. But the identity is, in his mind, he's driving in it to the cubicle. He thinks you think that he's on a way to pick up a, a, a supermodel to go climbing in the Alps, in his mind. But you're not. You see a Schmendrick in a, broken, in a, in a new little car. It's like the reverse is true, too. A guy in a Bentley turbo convertible, what do you see? Do you see a rich man? No, you see a, a man who's inadequate inside, who needs to show off. An old guy is trying to show you he's rich. That's another thing in the car. So cars show us stuff. We all do it. That's what I'm trying to get across. Everyone's a star behind the car. Everyone's a star behind the bar. Every bartender's a star. Am I right or wrong? So what does that have to do with politics? Figure it out. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders. 
language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. The Latin Dance Hour with Senor Savage. I actually was playing the timbales during the break for this music. You have a set of timbales next to the desk. I used to play when I was younger. And uh, just hitting the bell, the old cowbell. It's amazing what kind of music you can get out of a cowbell. When you think of the music, how it evolved on a farm amongst, you know, cowhands, farmhands. They took the instruments they had, a cowbell, and they turned it into music. It's astounding. Anyway, the point is not about music. Or is it about music? Is there any music in this campaign? That's, that's another question. Because this whole campaign on the Republican side seems to be, I'm sorry to tell you, cruise baiting people. Holier than thou and more conservative than thou. Imposing a litmus test on all of them. On the Constitution, Christianity and Chastity, the three C's of this campaign. You know, the litmus test. Where do you stand on the Constitution? I am a better Christian than you. I am more chaste than you are. The three C's. I'm tired of it, frankly. And I can't wait for it to be over, to be honest with you. I hope Trump wins and that's it. Let him get the job done. But this is going to go on now. On and on and on and on and on. With the wicked witch of Warwick on the other side hanging in the wings. She should have been arrested a long time ago. If you ever did one-fiftieth of what she did with the emails... You'd be in such a dark holding cell, you wouldn't have, you would not, no, no amount of lawyers on earth could get you out. Just on the, on the fear that you'd flee the country. But that's because she has NPR in her pocket, because she has, you know, the networks, because she has all of these talking heads in her pocket. They're not asking her about it. Idiots like Anderson Cooper had the nerve to ask Bush last week before the big fall what his favorite music was. I felt, you know, I felt bad for Bush. This is not a good, I mean, I'm, let's put this, I didn't want him to win, okay? We knew he's a rhino, we knew he's washing establishment. He's not a bad guy, for God's sakes. He wasn't the devil, he wasn't an evil man, you know? And you see a guy like that, and you know he was not the strongest of the brothers, right? The bumbler was probably tougher than him. The bumbler, with the hesitancy, was probably a tougher kid than he was. This guy was like a nice guy, you know, and I know he's going to suffer for this. This is bad. The next thing is after a loss like this, I, I'm not saying, I wish it doesn't happen, but usually a suffering, a humiliating loss like this, a disease follows not too long after. I'm sorry, I'm not saying it should happen. The opposite, I hope. But this kind of gut loss is a killer for a man at that age because it's over. The Bush dynasty's finished in a way, thank God. Not that they were all bad either, by the way. You could say that they were a corrupt establishment. Republicans it would all be true. But on the other hand, compared to the, what we got on the other side, you know, when you got the communists waiting on the other side and the Islamists waiting on the other side and the, the spies they put in everywhere and the deviants everywhere you turn. So, you know, so, okay. but now we got Trump versus who? Who's going to win? Who knows already? Probably Trump. It looks like Cruz, uh, it's over. He got a good beating in the cage fight the other night. And, I, and I've seen fights before, you know, if he couldn't win in South Carolina... With the with Bible, with the snakes, with the whole holy roller thing, holding up the Constitution like he wrote it, holding up the cross like he was the disciple of Jesus himself, and pledging a chastity that no one could meet up, you know, live up to. And he's still lost amongst evangelicals. And I figure the next step is even worse. And everyone now, oh, oh, Trump could win. Everyone, all the doubting Thomas who threw mud at him. Oh, now Trump, oh, he could win. You know, that guy could win and go all the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we're all on his side all of a sudden. They put the finger up with the saliva on it, so which way the wind was blowing, now they're all for Trump. They're all lining up. Whether he'll remember me or not, I don't know. What do I want out of it? I don't need anything. At the end of the day, I think about it. I had a dream, actually. Went to dinner with him, and we talked. I, know, I met him once at the club. Brought his wife over. This is like three years ago, four years ago. And I only go there once a year. I haven't been there this year once. I only go to Florida once a year. And every time I go to go to Mar-a-Lago once. And if he's there, I say hello to him. He says hello to me. So like two years ago, he came up with his wife. I said, Mr. Trump, how are you? He says, oh, Mel her name is Melania, right? The beautiful wife. I don't know her name. Is it Melania? Who? I can't pronounce it. Let me say Melania. I'm from the Bronx. Melania. I'm not from Hungary. Melania, whatever. 
Can we just cut it? Anyway, she's like Jackie Kennedy, incidentally. She is this generation's Jackie Kennedy. Wow, what a first lady she'd make with that foreign accent, like Zsa, Zsa Gabor on top of it all. America would so be in love with her. You can't believe it. I, I don't want to finish that sentence because you know what the rest of this one is, but there's no, no sentence that follows that one. The whole family would be a pleasure. We'd be proud again. I mean, this guy can make America great again just by winning with his family. The whole world would start saluting us because of his wife. Are you kidding? Everyone loves style. So the thing is, uh, yeah, now also, she came up and he said, oh, Michael Savage, he was with his lovely young son. He was a kid, dressed nice like in a suit, like an eight, ten-year-old in a suit and tie. I never had a suit. I had a suit, but I never wore it at that age. But where I came from, no one wore suits except uh, if you died, they put you in a box one. But the thing is, none of the men I knew ever wore a suit. A wedding or a funeral, that's the only time the men I knew wore suits. They were immigrants and they worked hard. But the thing is, he says, oh, Melanie, I want you to meet Michael Savage. He's one of the most important men in the media. I thought it was funny. But it, you see, even from the beginning, he was very complimentary. Maybe he knew he was going to run. And he needed friends in high places. But that's the only time I met him. So I have a dream. I met him and we talked. And I've thought about it. Many people say a joke. A friend called me up. I hadn't heard from him in a long time. He said, hey, so Mike, when Trump wins, you're going to be made Secretary of State. I laughed. <laughs> no, not likely. A, number one, no one's asking me. And B, I would not do well in a job like that. That's suit and tie, sitting around. I'd be a good negotiator with them. I Because I, I know most of them are corrupt. I'd look right through them. And I wouldn't let them get away with what they get away with. I don't want a job. Like, I don't want a job at all. I have a job. I'm retired, basically. This is my retirement job. I've been doing it for 21 years. <laughs> it's the hardest thing I ever did in my whole life, talk radio. There's nothing harder on earth. Nothing. Nothing can compare to this because you are... You're on a verbal tightrope for three straight hours. You say one wrong word, you are crucified and you're dead for life. Trust me, I was banned from Britain for something I didn't even say. I just know the stakes are so high. I guess I like it. I love the high wire act. I thrive on it. Ask the guys who work with me. Sometimes at five minutes before the hour that it starts, I can hardly move sometimes from exhaustion or allergies. Or maybe it's my body playing possum before I strike, you know, like a snake. All I can tell you is that I feel dead. And the minute that I hear that theme song, within a few seconds, it's like an adrenaline is running through my body. And ask him, it's true. And it's a matter of whether I can figure out how to hook you, get you interested, come up with a theme, a question, go into the thing. Here we are. Here we are already an hour and 12 minutes into it, playing some great music. But the whole election, as I say, seems to be about baiting people, holier than thou, more conservative than thou. You know, are you now or have you ever been a member of this party? Litmus test. Are, are you constitutionally correct? Are you a good enough Christian? Mr. Christian? And if you are, well, you're not as chaste as I am. I am a more chaste man than you are. Because I carry around the Bible and I can prove to you I'm better than you are. That's what it is. It's kind of boring uh, at the end of the day. I'd really rather hear about building a wall, crushing ISIS like a cockroach, what I really like to know is if Trump wins, is he going to go and arrest these Obama criminals, try them? That's what everyone's saying. Will he actually try Obama for the crimes he's committed against this nation? Will he let him get away with it? The answer is he won't touch him. But even Obama has modified his pitch. Do you know that the Trump's candidacy has already had an effect upon everything in this country? You don't know that. I do. That's why I'm paid to do a talk show. I see things you can't see until I explain it to you. Then you say, you know, he's right. Even Obama is now suddenly defensive on what a big government liberal maniac he is. I played that speech last hour. No, I'm not a big government liberal. We look at everything and evaluate costs and benefits. Yeah, right. Like your wife's personal assistance, your vacations, your abuse of power. Sure, you, you have value, right? But even he's suddenly uh, backpedaling. He sees the popularity of Sanders. He sees the popularity of Trump. And he suddenly sees that he is the odd man out and everyone's on to him. As they're saying, well, will he pay for this, for what he's done to this country, how he's spent us into oblivion, printing money, a $13 trillion debt the last I checked when he came to power, wasn't it $3 trillion? Now it's $13 trillion? Where'd the money come from? Obama has committed a financial crime. If a hedge fund operator did this, he'd be in jail. If a hedge fund operator ran his books the way Obama's running this country, that hedge fund, you know, you watch a show like Billions. U.S. attorney's going after this hedge fund operator. He wants to destroy him because he's jealous. 
He says, evil 